Hey everyone and welcome to the Mindtrace podcast episode number one. I'm your host Ajmal Savari. I'm the founder and CEO of Mindtrace and I'm also a neuroscientist. On my journey from the academic world into industry, I've seen many misconceptions on both sides and it feels as if the gap is becoming wider. The goal of this podcast is to create a bridge and not just a superficial one. We're having in-depth conversations with people from industry and science with a special focus on user experience, also known as UX. My take on UX is that it's not limited to graphic design or interfaces. From my perspective, UX incorporates all things that are designed. That can be a form of therapy or treatment to visual illusions or restaurant designs. We'll find out what UX can implement from scientific insights and what questions UX practitioners have for scientists to investigate. Maybe the questions were already answered, but it got lost in communication and never made it to the practitioners. I'm also convinced that industries can learn from each other. For example, UX principles used for web shops could also be applied to menu designs of restaurants or vice versa. The actionable bits that will come out are for you to use in your work, your life, or simply as inspiration or motivation. All right, let's do it. My guest today is Raphael Smalls. Raphael is involved in many different projects, ranging from organizing annual conferences where academia, business and government meet, to teaching courses in entrepreneurship and more. Our conversation focuses on the UX of teaching entrepreneurship from the perspective of the teacher. We dissect the topic and also problems with the current way and how it can be further improved. We start by first talking about Raphael's background so you can also see that he is the perfect person to talk to about this topic. If you want to reach out to him, you can find him on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash in slash rsmals or check his personal website at www.rsmals.nl. All right, enough background. Let's get into it, shall we? All right. Let's go then. You ready? I am. Okay. So, well, welcome, Raphael. Thank you. Well, thank you for taking the time. And um, yeah, so this, this already, now that we actually started recording, feels much more stiff than the conversation we had before which felt much more relaxed it's interesting isn't it but it's, it's going to disappear funny. it's okay i, I <laughs> hope so I we're hope going so. to relax yeah so yeah today i wanted to talk to you about the basically the ux of teaching entrepreneurship from the perspective of the teacher not from the ones that actually want to become entrepreneurs or for whatever other reasons they're taking that class and um well in all honesty we have met in the Gelderland Startup Accelerator, where I was a student exactly. and you were the instructor. Two years ago, yeah. That's oh, it's been two years. It's ago. been two years, yeah, yeah, years. yeah. We had we had these we had these drinks a few weeks ago, and that was when I was when I realized it was already two years. It, it doesn't feel that long. No, no. It, even though now, when you say two years, it's it's clear. It's it's a bit makes a bit more sense. I mean, in my mind. Because so much has happened. So and much has happened on both sides. On both I sides, mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. And if all that has had only happened in one year, I think that would have been unhealthy. <laughs> yeah, maybe. It would have been a lot of work, <laughs> at least. Yeah. Now, my, I have a question for you, and this is, this is, this has nothing to do with a with a with a purpose of this podcast at all. Not this was just a personal yeah. curiosity. Okay, sure. Which is, you know, ever since we met each other. And just like now, you always have a smile on your face. <laughs> All right. I've never actually met you without a smile on your face. Seriously. And in my research and in, in, in the for the preparation of this, I found a situation where you did not have a smile on your face. Really, really. Which is the photo at the end of your PhD thesis. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I uh, I don't have my thesis uh, at hand here, so I'd have to look for it. Uh, do we have that photo somewhere? Because no, I, 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 was, I was very surprised actually. It's, I, I, if I recall correctly, I think it was a self portrait a portrait that I made at some point, and 
You know, I uh, I don't work that well on camera, I suppose. <laughs> so it's good that it's, a, it's an audio blog and it's not a vlog. <laughs> no, I mean, all your other photos that I found were, were totally okay. It's just all because you're smiling and the angle and lighting is good. But that one, it looked like you were done with it. <laughs> it, is, it is probably because I took it myself. And it's uh, like the other photos I generally... Uh, no, actually the ones on my LinkedIn, I think I... I need to update it as well. It's kind of a sensitive topic, you know, photos of me. I, I work better behind the camera, not in front of it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, your, your passion is photography, right? It I is, can see it that. is in the old fashioned way. So chemistry, uh, getting my hands wet, literally. Uh, there's, there's somebody on an online forum. His subtitle is uh, Real Photos Are Born Wet. And I really subscribe to that. I just like the tangible aspect of it. And uh, yeah, so it's my passion. It's my hobby. I spend a lot of time on it. Uh, if I'm not teaching entrepreneurship to people <laughs> or other stuff. But that's good. Uh, yeah. So then what I would like for the listeners is to, I mean, I know your background now very well. At least I'd like to think so. You did some research. Um, yeah. But the listeners don't. And I just want them to realize that you are really the perfect person to talk to about this. So from a, from a very young age, you already started to work with IT. I did. Because yeah. your, your dad, he ran a, a small IT firm. And well, can you can you tell me a bit about that IT firm and especially the jobs that you did? The jobs that I did. Okay, so uh, so let's let's go back to, you know, way back before I was born, because I look a lot like my dad. And uh, we have one thing in common, uh, which is that um, uh, we don't work that well within a fixed organization, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So we need to have a sense of freedom and uh, the ability to do our own things and follow our own routes. And that was true for my dad as well. So this is also why he had an IT firm. Uh, he had been in IT actually since it first became a thing at least in the Netherlands. So he started working in that sector in the, in the early 1970s, around 1970. Uh, there was in corporate environments, uh, then there was an economic downturn in the 1980s. And that was basically, uh, this is a long story st uh, short, but he, that sparked his own entrepreneurship. He started making software for uh, administrative purposes. Uh, for industrial users, bakeries and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was what I witnessed in the early 1980s. You know, my, my dad building code and, uh, you know, putting on a suit and going to the customer and uh, implement all, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and selling hardware uh, was something that came with it because that software needed to run on something. So he needed to import the hardware and sell it off. And it was kind of a sideshow. And then uh, come the 1990s, uh, the sideshow became the main uh, theme. I mean, uh, hardware, you know, lifted off. Uh, yeah, computers yeah. became affordable for home users. So his business kind of shifted from building custom-made software to delivering hardware to uh, private users, corporate users. And these were usually uh, like really domestic users up to uh, small, medium enterprises, schools, oh, wow. educational institutes. Uh, usually not the really big organizations. But it went hand in hand with the PC revolution. It went absolutely hand in hand with the P PC revolution. And you have to keep in mind that back in those days, 1990s, the product was not commoditized the way it is right now. So it was not really an off the shelf product. Uh, so he basically bought the components and then assembled, um, built to order, and also built to the specifications that sort of met the needs of the customers. So everything was really custom made. And uh, that was still possible because you, you still had the uh, financial slack and there was, there was the profit margin still allowed to do that, to right. put in that kind of effort. Uh, this was a really small uh, operation. It was like just my dad and, you know, a few guys, you know, helping out once in a while, maybe a few times a week if there was a lot of work. Um, and this was really, uh, this relied on passion, personal interest in, in the technology. Yeah. Um, we had a subscription to CT magazine. It still exists. It's a German magazine. Yeah, I know that magazine very well. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, you come from Germany, so you're obviously familiar with it. And uh, uh, even, you know, back then, I'm, I'm not sure I haven't read it in a while, but it was really the best for in-depth information on uh, what's new and what's uh, what's yeah. hot. So that was kind of the stuff that we, uh, as a kid, so here the, the story becomes a bit more personal. As a kid, uh, I always looked forward to actually receiving the new CT magazine. I think it was bi-weekly, so t two times a month. 
uh, and we got it obviously in German. There was a Dutch translation that was like super thin. We, we, we didn't use that. So uh, I learned to read German oh, <laughs> through wow. actually reading a CT magazine. That's beautiful. Uh, and I, I think I understood like 40% of it. So <laughs> it was not too bad. That's pretty good. It was, it was good enough. And um, so I must have been like 12, 13, 14 years old. Um, and obviously, you know, having the company literally at home, you know, we were living between the boxes of monitors and, and main boards and keyboards and, um, you get infected with it in a way. And I remember that uh, when I was 15, my dad took me on, uh, sort of a business trip. It was basically, he had just, uh, sold a 100 megabit network to a customer in The Hague. And 100 megabit back in 1994 yeah, that was or fast. so, that was fast. That was and this, fast. Was, this was not, this was not um, a regular ethernet, this was 100 VG from HP. It was also a niche project, product. And they had all these uh, fancy PCI cards in the server and in the, in the workstations. And uh, well, long story short, uh, the, the, the network card in the server didn't work. And you have to keep in mind, this was the, the days of MS-DOS. And I think the server was running a uh, novel network. Okay. Um, and they didn't get it to work. Uh, HP support was cold. They, they weren't able to help either. Uh, and you know, as sort of sort of a last resort, I didn't know much about computers anyway. I I knew a command prompt, and uh, my dad said, you know, why didn't you give it a try? And I was like, I had no idea what I was doing, but I was fiddling for ten minutes or so, and then for some magical reason, it worked. And everybody was like, how did you do that? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> and I thought, but I need to find out. And uh, Which is what many more IT people actually should admit from time to time. I don't know. I don't know. No, but it's, this was, I mean, this was trial and error. Yeah. And I learned the scientific method years, I mean, a decade later. Uh, so I just, you know, did something, make it up as I went along. Uh, and that's where it started. So I was 15 and uh, from that point on, I became to work systematically in, uh, in the business, assembling computers, uh, advising people and mainly a lot of troubleshooting. And uh, so that's what I did until the early 2000s. Then my dad turned 65 and he said, well, uh, I'm going to quit. You know, I've I've worked enough in my life uh, and the choice is up to you. I was in university back then studying information management. Uh, my dad basically gave me the choice. Either I'm going to um, I'm going to stop the business. So I'm going to kill it, uh, maybe sell it off or something. It was a really small business uh, or I'm going to give it to you to play with, basically. And I said, you know, I can, you know, it's nice to do. Uh, next to my study and I'm, I'm not going to study full time anyway because that bores me so you know I, I'll do the nice customers and the high value added things um, and uh, basically get rid of the rest basically let it bleed a little bit and just keep maybe 20% of the business right and that's what I did for a few years uh, along with my studies sort of have a have a play thing and uh, earns a little money with that it was not that much, but uh, it allowed me to do the fun stuff. And, uh, and of course, by that time, the market became more of a commodity. Um, more standardization. More standardization. There was still a little niche like where I could focus on very high value added customers, you know, architects, this, that kind of business. Uh, they had very specific requirements. Uh, but I kind of foresaw that that was a temporary thing as well, you know, within a few years that would end. Uh, so I basically, by the time I went to do my uh, master's degree, my, my research, I decided I'm going to focus full on on that research for six months and then find a real job, you know, <laughs> something like that. So that was basically the end of the business. We basically let it taper out, sort of. Um, in the end, I, I kind of sold off the contacts to uh, another small company, a guy uh, living nearby. And I said, like, here's, here's the customers and, uh, uh, you know, take good care of them. Right. And I'm not really sure if he did, but uh, I hope so. So then, I mean, you also mentioned that you, you then uh, studied information management while you partially were still playing with that company exactly. after your dad yeah. retired. Um, 
you then actually did research at a nuclear power plant, which I now actually find interesting that you said your dad still does that now yeah. with stuff for nuclear power plants. I, we inspired each other. I got the opportunity. It's it's not something I went to a nuclear power plant and then asked her, so kind of kind of nose around a little bit. But right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was actually a PhD cool. research of uh, of somebody else, uh, Gert van den Ede. He, uh, I think he still uh, works in academia in Belgium. And he was doing his PhD in Tilburg at the moment, at, at the time. And um, for data collection, they had uh, this idea that they could bring some master students along, mm -hmm. you know, to do interviews. And uh, I, in the end, we ended up doing these interviews together. Uh, so we went to the power plant, it was dual nuclear power plant near Antwerp in Belgium. Uh, I think I visited the place like four or five times. Uh, I don't really recall, It's uh, it's been 10 years. Um, it was insanely interesting, um, <clears throat> not just because of the organization itself, but also because of the technology underlying it. And I, I wanted to understand all of it. Mm -hmm. So I read all I could get my hands on about nuclear power plants. And my interest in terms of my thesis topic was about the reliability of a nuclear power plant and particularly the maintenance organization uh, around that. So it was also obviously super important. <laughs> super important. I was also super interested in uh, you know any kind of failure method. <laughs> so I read everything I could about Three Mile Island, about Chernobyl, uh, Fukushima. Of course, hadn't happened back then, but uh, I read up on that as it happened as well. Um, so there was kind of uh, yeah, uh, it, it captured my interest in on uh, in one side the technology aspect of an organization like that, and on the other side the societal or the organizational aspect, mm -hmm. and that is that is um, a common theme throughout my career. Right. No, I agree. As at least that's what my research also suggested. Yeah, it's I could you can see, see that theme. Yeah, you can I see it in see every in every aspect. Yeah. yeah, because after you did that, then you went, uh, you you gathered more industry experience working at ASML. Yeah, um, I actually have no idea what ASML stands for, but it's a huge company. It's uh, the acronym is a difficult one. I'm, maybe there's an official reading these days, but back then I was told that there was no clear official definition for it. Maybe we should not say that so loud, um, loud for maybe. the marketing department. Uh, I don't know. I, yeah, I'm probably wrong. The market department knows knows best. That's uh, true. That's true. I always thought it was something like advanced semiconductor manufacturing lithography or something like that. I kind of it would make know sense. What it, it would make sense. It was good enough for me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> But yeah, so then, and after you did that, basically spending, studying, but also having all this experience in industry, after that, you actually decided to make the jump to academia and then you did your PhD. It was kind of decided for me. Oh, it was uh, oh, Well, again, obviously it's a few countries, so we might make our own choices, but uh, this, it, uh, um, I tend to go with what people suggest me if I trust them. Um, so I was working at ASML in supply chain management, uh, which was really a one year project. So I had this one year co contract. And after that, I was uh, basically, you know, thinking about what should I do next? So towards the end of that term there, my boss at ASML, he had these contacts in Nijmegen. And he said, there's uh, two professors and you should talk to them uh, because they have this research program and there's one spot for a PhD student and we also have an interest in that as a uh, as a company but at a personal level he said I think this is the right option for you to consider he also had done his PhD in Eindhoven so he knew what he was talking about mm -hmm. so I went to have a chat with these professors and uh, basically I, I don't remember much of it it's, it's been a while but uh, we talked for about an hour and these were two elderly gentlemen i mean they were close to their pension age and they were very friendly and they there was not a lot of stress and they we just had a nice conversation and i remember at some point one of them asking so do you like to read and i said sure i do like to read and in my memory it was a bit like okay you're hired you know <laughs> it's good enough um uh, probably it was a little bit more strict than that and uh, probably they did they did actually look at grade lists and stuff but um I, you know for some reason i got hired for that and they had enough uh, confidence in uh, in me and um i i went to do my research uh partly also at asml so there was also that company interest in it uh which was about uh how do you collaborate on a long-term basis with your suppliers if you're a high-tech 
manufacturing firm. And particularly if you, if you want to outsource innovation work, how do you manage that on a long-term basis as the technology evolves and the relationship evolves along with it? Uh, so basically I was trying to get a grip on the, the, dy the dynamics of these kinds of biosupply relationships. Right. <clears throat> and after you finished your PhD, you went into teaching. I also went into teaching. I also went to work for one of the firms that I uh, had investigated. So I kind of did a teaching and consultancy thing. And I kind of kept doing that over the years that followed. So basically, we're, we're now in the present. Um, <clears throat> uh, but teaching has become an even more important component of my work. Uh, I still do that a lot. And uh, again, I kind of... Um, when I was doing my PhD research, I obviously I needed to know uh, something about doing research. And in Tilburg, studying there, I, I never really got any course on research methods. So I was hired to do a PhD research and I had no idea about, you know, doing research. Oh, really? I, I didn't. And, I, you know, I, I ended up doing qualitative research, but I knew, well, I kind of knew in advance it was going to be like that. Um, so one of the first things I thought was, OK, let's um, let's follow a research methods course. And there happened to be one at the ma uh, management faculty for bachelor students. So I was a PhD student. I went to sit with these bachelor students in the classroom and just listen in on these, uh, these courses. And um, then after, uh, it was very educational. I learned a lot of things and it gave me a little bit more confidence and I, I could actually do that. And then after I finished my PhD, one of my former colleagues was already teaching there in that same course that I had attended. And he said, we need somebody to teach some work groups and uh, are you available? And I said, well, sure, I can give it a try, but you know, research methods, can I do that? And isn't it very boring? And, uh, but you know, I just did it. And I, I do remember that my first work group, I had um, a group of all guys, 30 guys sitting in front of me, bachelor students, 20 years old, something like that. It was Thursday morning, quarter to nine. And I said, okay, if you look at a block of courses, there's always one or two courses that really interest you. Uh, you know, when you start the block and uh, there's the rest of the courses you kind of think, well, it's maybe interesting, maybe not. And there's one or two courses that you think this is not going to be good. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, OK, so who thinks this is one of the more interesting courses? And obviously, no hands went up. <laughs> and uh, I said, OK, I'm not going to ask you if you think this is the course is going to be you know, that's basically going to suck. But I'm going to guess that this is what you think. And they said, yeah, 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 this is basically the truth. I said, well, I would have been the same way. Uh, but we'll have to make it out of the woods together. Exactly. Uh, so, you know, at first glance, this is not my favorite topic, but let's see how far we get. Uh, and of course, by then, I, all, I had already realized that it can be much more interesting than it seems at mm -hmm. first glance. Yeah. Um, and I actually started to like the topic. So I've been doing that for a few years now, also in different places. And uh, it kind of fascinates me how people do things and how you how do you do something, mm -hmm. you know, uh, processes, procedures, um, uh, having different options, different scenarios and choosing between them. And research methods is about that as well. Yeah. In the end. No. And I mean, just just based on what you said on your the experience you had with your dad, the how the company grew, how you had to take over. I mean, or no, let me say how you were allowed to take over or also on that business trip, having all these different experiences from putting a computer together, doing your R&D by reading basically the CT magazine, yeah, which was yeah. in German. That was, that was our R&D. <laughs> and, yeah. and then, and then um, doing the customer relation uh, ships and troubleshooting, yeah. Yeah. going there yourself, uh, actual interaction, yeah. and then also experiencing sales. Yeah. I mean, this is a host of experiences normally. Exactly. People yeah. don't get, um, and that was from a practical perspective. There was a practical perspective. And I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. Well, and it also included uh, doing the financial in, uh, yeah. administration, doing purchasing, yeah. oh, wow. uh, doing software engineering, because this, this was also the internet boom. So I made right. a content management system and sold that to a couple of customers as well. Oh, wow. um, so really making it up as you go along. Yeah. Um, but that's what I mean. I mean, just that experience you have industry wise. Yeah. And or let's let's call this call it the practical actual implementation experience hands on and yeah. now also teaching entrepreneurship i think it's you're the perfect person to talk to about this and i hope now everyone's convinced on the other side as well 
Um, but for them to also know, and, and I'm curious as well, what other types of courses or workshops have you taught that were targeted at entrepreneurship? Well, actually, uh, not all that much, um, but you see entrepreneurship popping up uh, in different ways in different courses. Um, right, so yeah. you, you should actually have to break it down. You know, what is entrepreneurship? Mm -hmm. And it's a set of competencies and, and also maybe a part of identity of somebody. Uh, and in that sense, it's, it sort of emerges in all the teaching that I do, but usually it's not even called entrepreneurship specifically. Yeah. Uh, so the kind of teaching I do is, uh, well, for example, the research methods, but let's keep that out of it because it's really, really academic mm -hmm. and well. Um, then I do some teaching on the interface of basically innovation management, uh, society and uh, general business management. This is uh, can also have to do with policy, for example, energy policy. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a part of a course that I teach at a business school in France. Um, which is basically about making students aware of, of the energy transition and also the role that, that uh, public policy plays in that. And how do you deal with that as a company, as an organization? So uh, I basically let them imagine being part of a company and also being in the position of government and making policy. And of course, that is also about the strategic direction of, of companies. And what, what I basically make them do as well is, is uh, position themselves in, the, uh, in a company and then looking at the world around them uh, <clears throat> and trying to create a vision for the future. Now, what is going to happen to the world of energy, uh, both uh, generation, uh, distribution and use, uh, things like the energy mix? And if you are, for example, uh, an oil producing company, what does that mean for you for the future? And what are your options? What are the scenarios? How are you going to respond to that? So it's a course about energy policy. That's what it's called. <clears throat> but it's in effect, it's really very much about strategic orientation mm -hmm. and trying to interact with the network of, of uh, stakeholders around you, including governments, but also the general public. Uh, so in a sense, that's not very much different from what an entrepreneur does. And, and you may recognize these yeah. things also from, from uh, the accelerator that we did, yeah. Yeah. where we have uh, basically... Um, they were just named content. slightly differently, but the core... It is, is named same, differently. Yeah. The content is very, very yeah. similar, but of course, it's tailored towards the, the, the audience right. and, well, so practical things. But the content is the same. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and of course, then there's there's the entrepreneurship accelerator that we do, and very closely associated with that is a sort of micro accelerator that I do with. Uh, uh, I've been doing that for three years now with um, uh, communication science students, and oh, um, nice. and so they're part of the social uh, sciences faculty in Nijmegen, and they have like a one day workshop. It's even less than one day; it's a two two hour workshop where I actually explain them uh, what entrepreneurship is. So they sign up for it, right? So they have these the three options and one of them is entrepreneurship, or right? It's actually called writing your business plan. Oh, okay. And uh, so, you know, communications. Yeah. And so writing your business plan and I talk to them about entrepreneurship sort of for two hours and then they start writing their business plan. And I always start by saying, okay, we're not really gonna write a business plan, <laughs> you know, for starters, because uh, that doesn't make sense in my mind. Um, so that's really very much about making people aware of entrepreneurship and what it involves, and also about different forms and that you don't actually have to uh, start your own company to become an entrepreneur. Because that's one of the misconceptions that entrepreneurship is about, you know, um, becoming the next Bill Gates and driving your Tesla down the road and making lots of money because you have some fancy tech product that you developed, you know. Right. It's kind of kind of the, the image that people sometimes have of entrepreneurs or maybe even the, the small town entrepreneurs that uh, you walk down the street and they have these shops and those are entrepreneurs. Those are entrepreneurs as well. Yeah, exactly. But I've met a whole lot more entrepreneurs working in larger organizations that, who don't have entrepreneur on their business card. Right. Uh, but I find that's also a weird thing to put on your business card, I think. Yeah, but it, 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 would, it would be nice, you know, particularly if you're a serial entrepreneur and actually you can have one business card with serial entrepreneur and serial killer. And then, 
yeah. you know, <laughs> try to p pick one and watch what, what capacity do we meet? <laughs> yeah, or you could have serial entrepreneur and then, you know, these tick boxes underneath just exactly. have 10 and let's see how far, how many do you have already? Exactly. And that that's would be the nice. card you then hand out. Oh, that would be nice. <laughs> yeah. I actually have to go around your contacts and contacts if you have one more entrepreneurship that you start and then you have to pick one more. Anyway. <laughs> but from, oh, from all depressed. these students then that you taught, on, it doesn't have to be like, right? It doesn't have to be named entrepreneurship course, but courses where you think principles of entrepreneurship were taught, or maybe even where you think students came to these courses directly for that content, yeah, ju just for yeah. that content. Well, how many of those do you, I mean, it's, it's a, it's just a, a guess. It's right? a guess. I, I don't. I, I don't no expect it to have. It. Uh, no, no. To have now a perfect uh, percentage. Well, actually, three uh, decimal uh, points. No. But uh, uh, how many of those do you actually think became entrepreneurs, as in starting their own business? It's a it's a work in progress, obviously, because my Always, teaching experience yeah. is, is of course limited to the past like five or six years. Um, but uh, I, well, funny anecdote. I I asked a group of French students at a business school mm -hmm. uh, a few months ago. I asked them, so what do you intend to do uh, after you finish this degree um, so who, who's gonna become a uh, consultant actually one or two hands went up it was surprised me because I had expected it to be more then I asked whom of you is gonna be a manager and um, virtually all hands went up so that was basically their future perspective just go into management and then I asked who's gonna work for themselves and nobody no, nobody replied um, if I project that or if I take that to, to different contexts where I've been doing teaching, if I had to do my estimate in, in the Netherlands, if I do teaching, it's usually a bit more. I would say maybe 10 to 15 percent have a vague uh, ambition of maybe starting a business at some point. Oh, that's more than I thought. Yeah, well, that, that would be, but you know, if you you asked how many actually do start, or, or and then it's probably intense. below 5 percent. Um, but actually have an active uh, and maybe there are some bias. So I, I mentioned these communication science students and they actually chose the topic writing your business plan. Uh, so they are inclined to be a bit more interested in actually right. becoming entrepreneurs. But even in that population, I asked them, so how many actually do you have? how many of you actually have the plans to become an entrepreneur? And it was a very small minority. It was still in a group of 30 people. It's like six or seven hands going up. Right. Uh, which kind of puzzled me because I thought, well, you chose the session to write a business plan. Exactly. That's is also what, what, what puzzles me as well. It's, uh, so when I've been teaching some courses, I like to ask at the beginning, what are your plans? Exactly. What, what, you what, what, what do you want to get out of it? Exactly. Or maybe where do you want to go? And even if your answer is, I don't know, I think that's a, that's a perfectly valid answer. I'd rather have you say that it's than fine. trying to make something up on exactly. the spot. Exactly. It's fine. Yeah. So then in some courses I taught, I had students there that said, no, I want to start my own business. Uh, I want to do this and I want to do that. And what went through my mind, unfortunately, was, wow, then you're definitely in the wrong course. Unfortunately. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Which uh, saddens me to say because they have been they have been told this is the place where you can learn that. Maybe they have been misinformed or yeah. maybe they have learned something since signing up about themselves. Uh, this is also possible. I mean, yeah, uh, possible. We, we know each other from the accelerator and one of the purposes of this accelerator in my mind, and maybe this was not the official purpose, but kind of it was understood also between the trainers, that one of the good outcomes of that accelerator is also if somebody recognizes I am not an entrepreneur. Yeah, of course. I should not be doing this. Yeah. Or I should be doing it, but I need a little help with this. I need people who are complementary to me. And I think it's the same thing with a course. It's it's perfectly fine if somebody follows a research methods course with me and then decides, okay, I'm not going to be an academic researcher. And in fact, it, this is 99% of my students in research methods say at the end of the course, very interesting. Thank you very much. Really helpful for writing my thesis. Uh, but this is not something I want to be be doing the rest of my life. And I said, well, that's totally fair. It's totally fair and yeah. totally to be expected. 
And obviously, then it's also a mission to not make something like that a burden to students. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, if you if you come to an entrepreneurship class and you walk out knowing more than before and being able to make a better decision for your own life, it was full, fully worth it. Then it's worth it. Yeah, it's totally exactly. Worth it. And so, so that is that is the added value of these kind of courses. Mm. Right. Um. Yeah, so my, my next question would be from your perspective, why did those students then enroll in that class? And I think now, now having reflected on that a little bit, that's, that might be even impossible to answer. Mm. Some have, might have been misinformed. It's, it's, it's impossible to change. answer, so uh, it, it will be pure conjecture. But right. um, I, can, I can answer in an abstract sense, I think, and maybe I will be speaking a little bit for myself and the things that interest me. Um, but I think, for example, looking at that group of students, uh, the, the writing a business plan uh, workshop students, mm -hmm. they, um, I noticed that they have a very strong interest in issues related to sustainability and corporate social responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, so if I tell them a story about changing the world, which is basically what my teaching is about. Um, you know, if you were to ask me, why do I teach? And I would say, uh, I'm a lazy person. I like to change the world by telling other people to change the world. And this is exactly what I, what I try to let them do in this, this uh, business plan writing session. Uh, so if I start talking about changing the world and also about uh, corporate social responsibility and responsible entrepreneurship, they really, they, they physically uh, sit up and listen. So this really appeals to them. And, and that really also comes back if you ask them, so what kind of plans would you have in terms of entrepreneurship, which is of course also part of the workshop that they develop a plan. Uh, it's very often about these, these social engagement. It's like, uh, how do we help the elderly to remain uh, connected to the rest of society uh, to make, for example, the use of social media easier for them? Um, these, these kinds of things. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's a sense of idealism. Mm -hmm. uh, if I look at the students in France where they have this energy policy course, it's again the same thing. You know, they have some interest in, uh, in the energy transition. Um, they, they know something is happening to the planet. And uh, whether it's about, you know, just good business sense that you have to do something about that, or it's about idealism that you actually want to contribute in a positive way. But they're interested in how can we make this change? And um, I think that is, that is a general motive uh, that everybody, to some extent, does have the ambition to change the world. Maybe we're not always explicit about it because right. it's kind of a big ambition, but I think everybody wants to change the world in a minor way. Which is totally fine. It's totally fine because if we all do that, it's, it, it is changing. And if somebody changes it in, in a major way, it's still fine. Hopefully uh, for the better. For the better, that would be nice. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, I can, see, I can see what you mean. It's, um, <clears throat> I think it's learning learning entrepreneurship doesn't necessarily have to mean you become an entrepreneur it's a set of tools you've been given yeah and these tools are universally applicable exactly and it does not have to mean you have to start your own business to use them no you can also do that while you're working at a company and maybe trying to get a promotion absolutely uh, it's absolutely. it's a very similar tools or how to work together and yeah and, uh, <clears throat> all of that fortunately there's of course a name for it okay then, then we call it intrapreneurship and this is one of the things that i make very explicit in my in my teaching on uh, entrepreneurship as well mm -hmm. i show people that uh, look you don't have to start your own business and go to the chamber of commerce and uh, to register and stuff uh, just to be an entrepreneur if you want to change the world you can choose the position from where you're going to do it. And if it's going to be your own business or an existing organization, uh, that, that's the question of, of, I would almost say, uh, the business model that you choose for yeah. your personal entrepreneurship. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But then what would you say that you, so you have, you, you mentioned you're teaching the classes in France. You do that uh, in, in Nijmegen at the Radbau University yeah. as well. We were at the Accelerator together um, you had another iteration of the accelerator, yeah. lots of connections with the 
startup scene within the Netherlands as yes. well because yes. it was directly coupled yes. location-wise with a second iteration at least. Yeah. What do you think is actually the biggest problem in, and now nobody can see it, but in quotation marks, mm -hmm. yeah. teaching entrepreneurship? Uh, that's a tough one. I, th I, um, because uh, you know, I haven't done market research on on uh, on courses or education or, or uh, tracks on entrepreneurship, so <laughs> it's kind of a difficult one. Um, <clears throat> oh, but just from from your from what you have seen, from, my, also, from what I've seen and yeah, what I've heard, yeah, yeah. I think there's there's uh, okay. I'm I'm, I'm going to go um, simplify matters to the point of being dangerous. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, always good. We yeah, can always, always back, we can always backpedal afterwards. Exactly, you can always cut it out. <laughs> Nuance can always be added. <clears throat> exactly, we can, we can always. So we will we will need nuance later on. Trust me. <laughs> but simplifying things uh, to a stupid extent, uh, you have one stream of teaching to entrepreneurship, which basically comes down like, look, I've I've been reading a little bit about teaching entrepreneurship, and I've I've had my own business, and I I will tell you how it's done. Mm -hmm. um, basically with an n equals one <laughs> exactly uh trust me i know what i'm doing i earned the tesla uh no matter if they just basically lucked out with good market conditions and stepping into the right market for some kind of weird reason uh and then based on that experience between quoting uh, quotation marks uh telling people how they should be doing it uh Again, dangerously simplified, but this is the more pragmatic approach. Oh, you know, I've, I've met these types of people. Yeah, and they and and I'm not saying that you should not be listening to them because uh, in many many things they will probably be right. Um, but you can, from an academic viewpoint, you can always ask: so, how solid is this mm -hmm. conceptually? You should ask that always. I, I think, think you should. At least you should ask yourself: Do I do I understand it on an at an a conceptual level, and does it still make sense at that level? And then we can take it. Actually, this is a nice bridge to the other uh, side, which is uh, teaching entrepreneurship from a from an academic perspective, which is like: Okay, we've done the Ennis uh, three thousand studies. And we know, basic, based on these statistics, that uh, successful entrepreneurs are people who take these and these and these boxes, and they make a business plan that consists of these and these elements. Uh, and then we see that in this percentage of cases, the uh, success follows. Hence, you should be doing, well, firstly, you should be start by being born as this and this kind of person <laughs> and then make this and this kind of business plan and then manage your business in such and such a sort of way. Uh, and then everything should, you know, it, it's an alignment for success and there, no guarantee of success, but there's a good chance of success. And again, uh, I think that is, um, um, uh, if you take that as gospel, it's obviously dangerous because, okay, then statistically your chance of success is going to be indeed, what is it, 17% or something? I don't know. What is the failure rate of new businesses? Is it remarkably high, okay? Right, yeah. uh, higher than 50% generally. Um, um, okay, then you're going to fall into that, you know, what is it, percent bracket? Uh, or maybe not, and your business is going to fail. Obviously, what you want is that in your N is one case, your business is going to succeed. And I think neither perspective is going to be helpful. So either, you know, looking across a very large population and say, you know, based on statistics, this is what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. Or the other hand, <clears throat> this is my personal experience, so you should be doing it the same way as I did. Uh, Neither is going to help. W what is going to work is if you have flexibility, um, uh, being able to dynamically respond to the situation that you encounter. Yeah, I agree with you that you have these two extremes, these these two extreme positions. Yeah. And I, I mean, it's it's a very often. So I, I I encountered both worlds as well. Yeah, the ones that say, "Oh, I did it. I know what I'm doing." Yeah. On and the receiving end. On the receiving end. Both. Yeah. yeah. And the ones that have been, let me just call it preaching for now. Yeah. Have been yeah. preaching, but have never done it. Exactly. And yeah. I think both are very dangerous to take as any type of proof, especially 
the ones that say I did it see and that do not like follow up questions that go more in depth because they are very allergic against that I noticed. Whereas the other end is just as allergic against it when you ask in-depth questions about practical implementation. Yeah. And I think whenever yeah. you encounter someone like that on whichever end of the spectrum that we just described is, take a step back and ask yourself, is this the advice that I can actually learn something from? Exactly. Yeah, that's, that is true. And um, mind you, I'm... I'm um, I'm kind of hesitant and I really don't want to put everybody who uh, tries to, t to teach people about entrepreneurship into the same corner. Oh, of course or the not. same two corners. I mean, obviously, there's there's a huge number of people who actually respond very well to questions that they cannot answer. Yeah. Uh, I mean, because that happens to all of us, right? Y you get a student or, or somebody who, who wants to learn from you and he, he or she asks a question and you generally don't know. We're all human, right? Yeah, so, right, I mean, right. what's wrong with just saying, okay, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Let's see if we can find out. Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Exactly. Or, you know, this is my best guess. I may very well be wrong, but this is what I intuitively feel. And, you know, do what it, whatever you want. Um, I think that's the only reasonable response in, in, a, in a case like that. I think so, too. Uh, but do you then, do you think the different, so we have now defined two Two extremes. Two, two extremes of yeah. the spectrum, of course. Yeah. yeah. I would say just from, from what I have experienced, when it comes to different educational entities, yeah. I would say the university is the, the danger of experiencing one of these two spectrums at the university, I would say is the insanely theoretical spectrum. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And but there are also other types of schools, right? We have yeah. the University of Applied Sciences, yeah, we have yeah, you yeah. Know, arts and design schools, which all are now trying to teach yeah. entrepreneurship. Yeah. Do you think at these different, let's say, applied sciences, arts yeah. and designs, do you think this the, the location of where we are mm -hmm. on the spectrum? Mm -hmm is different for the different educational entities? I think so. I think so. I, th I think it, it probably correlates to right. some extent. And of course, it depends on, on the specific individuals you encounter. But if I look at you know, the people around me, then I see that lots of people with... Uh, so for, talking, for for example, about the, uh, the, the universities of applied sciences, mm -hmm. right? These uh, I see people working there with uh, very often practical business experience, entrepreneurial experience, and also at least uh, some and sometimes a very decent theoretical background, but not maybe with the same conceptual clarity that you see at a university. Mm -hmm. But they can translate more abstract models into uh, actual practical recommendations or advice. And, you know, working with these people, and of course, that is also the reason why we work together, because we're complementary. Uh, uh, one of the things that I try to bring, of course, is this conceptual clarity right. uh, and consistency and, and challenge them on that uh, part. And of course, they challenge me on the more practical part, uh, where I mean, where I kind of fit in one part of the spectrum, namely the, the quasi entrepreneur who has done the IT thing. You know, for for a few years, and based on that, things he knows what running a business is. Right. But it's just that business. Um, but I do think that you see different, uh, yeah. So that the institutions where you can learn something about entrepreneurship kind of plot on this uh, continuum, and hopefully uh, there are also um, institutions where uh, that kind of strike a good middle ground, and uh, you know. I the, think very the many do. Sound, the applied uh, sciences it really come very close, and again, it really depends on who you encounter. Because there's people like those at universities as well, and and you find That's them uh, actually in in the entrepreneurial world as well. Mm -hmm. So it really comes down to finding the right individuals, I think. Uh, but given you know, if you're looking for optimizing the chance of finding the right people, then maybe the University of Applied Sciences are a very good spot to look in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's and, interesting. And generally, they have their networks connecting with universities as well. So if, if there's more theoretical background needed, uh, or, uh, then obviously it's, it's fairly easy to make that connection as well. Right. Because that's, that's something that, that I have seen universities struggle with, uh, having industry connections, at least. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can be quite frank. 
at least I, I'm, I'm coming from university background. Whatever I have seen as industry connections are nothing else but superficial connections that are yeah sometimes. that are sold as I know somebody at Microsoft. It's like your friend works at Microsoft, and that's fair, that's fine, sure. but do not sell that as a actual business connection for your students to come sign up with you. Yeah. And this is what I have seen happening a lot. Really? Yes. Okay. And it's. Yeah. Uh, um, I have been also blindsided by it by, by myself mm -hmm. uh, because yeah. I thought, oh, wow, this, uh, this could be... Um, f first, I liked the, the person. And then I thought, wow, they are willing to help me with these great connections that they have, which turned out to be nothing, non non-existent, basically. Um, which made me quite a bit sad, <laughs> but but also made me question, who else does that? And then when I looked around, I started to see it's common practice to do this at the university, yeah. which makes me even which makes me quite mad uh, and angry for all the the students who believe the professor and then well basically count on the professor and have just been baited actually, and that's uh, I don't know I have. I, I find this just terrible practice. I, uh, I obviously I have not very much experienced this as a student. Al although I, um, to some extent, of course, I studied information management, and I noticed that there was uh, a partial overlap between uh, the the faculty and the business world. Right. So it was pretty common there to encounter people who, for example, were teaching two days a week and being a consultant three days a week. Uh, so there was a pretty good connection. We we also had some some professors that were really uh, tightly networked with uh, with companies where they had working relationships uh, right. existing many many yeah. years. Uh, in fact, if I look at my PhD uh, uh, period I, in the introduction, I talked about it very very briefly. But one of these uh, kinder older gentlemen that I encountered, my it turned out to be my promoter in the end. Uh, he he is a um, now emeritus professor in management science mm -hmm. but he has the most amazing network in the business community ranging from uh, companies in the Netherlands in sustainable energy technology to uh, Volkswagen to Toyota uh, wow. really uh, it's well it's a different story but he's really very well networked and these people know him he knows them uh, the problem is he is kind of a last of the Mohicans. Ah, oh, that's um, sad. And you see that in academia, of course, uh, like we all know, the, the emphasis is very much on publication, you know, publish or perish. It's, it's, an, it's a reality that we all know and it's very difficult to ex escape from. Uh, but I think at a deeper level is that there is a selection mechanism to select those people within academia that perform well on academic tasks, but not necessarily on uh, business acumen. Right. right, it's a, just a different character. If I look in uh, around me in ASML or or, or whatever technology company, uh, particularly at, for example, a purchasing department, I've seen quite a few purchasing departments of these high tech companies. Obviously, it's a completely different profile that I encounter there than if I look around me at my academic colleagues, right. and they're both sets of fine people with with amazing competences, very valuable. But I could not transplant either of them in the other place. And it, it, it really works both ways. Mm -hmm. I cannot, even if they have an academic degree, I cannot put a purchasing manager in the management faculty and expect it's gonna work. Because yeah. both sides of the deal are gonna, they're gonna go mad within two weeks. And they know it, you know? And it's the, it's the other way as well. I, my academic colleagues, I would not curse them by trying to transplant them into the business world. It's, nobody's going to be happy, uh, happier for it. And I think that makes it difficult to bridge the gap because that's really a different language. Mm -hmm. um, it's but the so gap is just, I mean, the gap is just going to get wider. The more we try to say, okay, you stay in your shoes, I stay in mine. The gap uh, is getting wider. It's getting wider. Yeah. And, and I on started both to notice sides. that as well, on both sides, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I, and not to the intention of either side, at least. No. It, that's no. how it seems to me. No. So it must not. be some some symptom coming from this, how, how the system is operating 
at the current moment. If you ask me, but you know, I'm not saying this as a social scientist, but just as a lay person looking at you know what happens around him, and I would say it's competition. Right. Uh, we are competing uh, each other just uh, until it bleeds. Yeah. And we do this in the business world and we do this in academia as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really a matter of scarce resources. And it means that we have managed the Slack resources out of both these sets of organizations very systematically. Mm -hmm. There are very little Slack resources in academia. So there's just very little time for the average university teacher, assistant professor to actually go out and visit his contacts at Microsoft or whatever. Right. You just don't have the time for it. If you have uh, 15 thesis students and they're doing 15 researches at 15 different companies and you have maybe 30 hours per thesis to read it, to, to second read another thesis. I mean, it's a lot of it's a lot of time that goes into just supervising the student. And ideally, you would like to actually meet up two or three times with the, with the organization as well to discuss how is it going, what is actually your, your knowledge need, and uh, you know, what kind of future projects could we, could we do. And the thing is always that if you're at a thesis defense, I mean, thesis are, are a good example uh, because that's where we really see interaction between the business world and universities. Um, if you're at a thesis defense and, and the internal supervisor from the company is also present and you sit, you know, together discussing the grade and how did the student do? Uh, and always I ask the question, so because usually it's a, it's a fun project and you have a good contact and a good rapport. And yeah, so shall we do another one, you know, if the opportunity arises? And they always say, yeah, that would be nice, you know, call me. Um, but in 90% of the cases, people are not being called. Right. Because it's very difficult to, to bring these things together. You get students assigned to you and you never know if they actually have the interests that fit with. And we do try, but you don't have the time, for example, between courses or between thesis trajectories to, to maintain these contacts. Mm -hmm. it's very, and that is what you should be doing. I mean, if you're working in academia, and I'm really talking about um, management science because right. that's closest yeah. to home for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you should be doing your account management. Yes, you definitely should. That is that is the whole key. I mean, you should be uh, like um, at least maybe half a day a week should be dedicated to actually going out, going to these organizations, uh, meet up with the people that you you've known for maybe five ten years. Uh, discuss how business is going, what kind of challenges they're running into, how the industry is changing, uh, and what kind of topics arise from that that you could actually assign students to, uh, where they can actually add value. Because if you just kind of wait until a student pops up and they have an idea and you just try to parachute them into an organization, uh, it's going to be there's going to be mild interest on both sides. Do you think by incorporating that type of practice, the content of the entrepreneurship courses would also improve? I think, I think if you bring entrepreneurs on board, and these can be entrepreneurs that, that, that have been working for a few years, a few years as well, that, that is insanely useful. And we did, the, we did exactly this thing, because as you recall, I mean, you were part of the first edition of the, of the Startup Accelerator, right? right? And as you recall, um, uh, there were two trainers and one was me and the other one was Bart. And Bart was, of course, also an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, and he then became director of an education and well, you kind of drifted off and he's going to be an entrepreneur again in the future, I predict. Um, but what we also did was for the second edition, we invited you along with uh, some other entrepreneurs to become the dragons. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where the new people would have to defend their business plans and their, their ideas. And we did that in order to, to really make a connection between existing but, but still fairly young entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and the really up and coming or starting, starting out entrepreneurs. So there's one example of, of, you know, you have to bridge these worlds by actually bringing the people together. Uh, so, yeah, I think that helps. Yeah. No, that, uh, that was definitely, it was also a fun experience for me once being on the other side, of the, the other side of the table. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm now not the one doing the pitching. I'm the one who's who, who people are pitching to. This was definitely a, a, 
just also from a practical perspective, very interesting to see because you often, when you make a product, it always says, oh, try not to think about how you would use it. Try to think about how your customer would use it. Yeah. So just as when you pitch, it always says, don't pitch for somebody who knows all this stuff. Try to think about the one who you're pitching to. Yeah. What do you want to get out? What's their background? That's how you need to you know, package yeah. it. Exactly. So when I was sitting on this other end, this was a very nice well, just experiment for myself. And uh, the experience was uh, was quite fun, I have to say. And it's um, at least as difficult sitting oh, on that sure. side of the table yeah, yeah. as opposed to pitching your plan. And uh, I mean, for the ones that, that don't know exactly what it was about, so it's it was modeled after the show Dragon's Den. For the ones that are not familiar with it, it's basically Shark Tank. Uh, it's, it's the same kind of concept. You get people in and you have the, in that case, what, what was it? I think we were four or five potential investors exactly. who then um, make an offer on the ones on the on the on the pitch of the people doing the accelerator, exactly. and that yeah. pitch came at the end of the accelerator, so they had yeah. ample time to work things yes. out. We have been working with these people for for I don't know three months or so, honing you know during a few sessions, honing their business ideas, and then they had to pitch it. And then we had this game where you, as uh, quote unquote investors, yeah. uh, could uh, press a button like I'm going to invest, yeah, 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 or not. Or hostile takeover was also or one. Hostile just... takeover was also one. Like I like this so much, I'm going to take it off the market because yeah. I, I want it <laughs> and uh that I'm was pretty cool it. and that was pretty cool and that was uh yeah so there was the whole concept of you know putting a little pressure on it as well yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but but definitely also triggering feedback from um uh actual entrepreneurs because along with you there was also this 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 woman who was uh putting all these solar panels on the roofs of of primary schools it Hilde, was her business. Right? Hilde? from slim yeah. Uh, opgewekt yeah exactly yeah uh brilliant great, woman. great company great company great, great entrepreneur yeah great company great person uh, ha has been doing that for about 10 years or so and her business is really taking off lately yeah. so yeah. uh uh so really people who actually have stood in the same shoes as the people pitching their plans yeah. uh, in a sort of quasi non-threatening environment as well, because there was, I mean, there was no actual hostile takeover and nobody got burned and, no. you know, but uh, it, it was exciting. Yeah. No, but yeah, this is definitely a cool experience. But, um, but you know, going back to your question of, of you know, do you need, how do you bridge the gap between academia and the business? Because that is, I think it's still an, a crucial thing. And it, it takes on the academic side that you have the time and the slack resources to actually be able to bring people on board mm -hmm. from, the, from the, the, the real world, from the business world. Uh, and on the other side, you also need people. And that is actually more difficult. You need people in organizations uh, who are sufficiently open towards the academic world. Right. I have not found many of those. No, there are few and uh, far between. And I think, you know, you can always, and that's what we currently do, we, you, you can put the responsibility with the academics and say, well, you should be translating your insights sufficiently towards a practitioner perspective. And sure, you know, you have to dumb your ideas down in such a way that everybody understands them. And I, I'm all for that, but dumbing down, I'm using that very deliberately, that term, right. also means you lose some of the essence. Uh, on the other side, you need absorptive capacity in organizations in order to deal with more complex uh, concepts. And that means that you have you have to have, particularly in larger organizations, some quasi quasi academics. Mm -hmm. And I do see them in governments, particularly larger governments, so regional provinces and, and, and ministries. Uh, there's no problem there. It's very easy to interface between academia and the larger governments. It's a seamless communication. Uh, we speak each other's language, basically. Oh, wow. That's uh, at least almost. I mean, we, we have our own sort of vocabulary, but we can, we can interface fairly easily. Um, but if you look at um, the business world, it's much more difficult. And there's also a lot of mistrust mm -hmm. within um, uh, business people, managers, um, uh, throughout the layers of organizations like, oh, 
it's academia it's all theory it's all you know uh, a difficult complex slow a low added value cannot be implemented is not useful Th these are the kinds of emotions that you kind of run into but it's more like a, I, I started to <clears throat> notice to me it feels this type of a response um, often feels like a like a protective self-preservation mechanism almost i think it has it's partly to because do it's, with I don't fear know, it comes out so like it's it's like almost like a reflex by now it's almost emotional yeah, as well in some it's, cases uh, it's, it's strange uh, i think it's it's what people do when we when we get confronted with something that we cannot fully understand that we kind of sort of fence it off and try to sort of uh, antagonize it yeah um and in, in part, I think it's also, um, it's also just, it's also right. Because mm. it's all these things to, to an extent are also true, you know, and there's, there's uh, if you work, for example, if you, I do a lot of thesis supervision. So that's why I come back to that. And also it's, uh, as we recorded, it's thesis season. So mm -hmm. it's front of my mind. Right. Um, <clears throat> If, if you have an organization that has never uh, worked with a thesis student before, particularly an academic thesis student, so university, uh, then they sometimes sort of expect that the, th the student comes in, uh, does their thing and solves a problem. Uh, oh, and yeah, that doesn't no, happen. That's, no, you know, that's, that's not the way it works. Not <laughs> that's not the way it works. Uh, a student like that, I think the added value is they, they come and bring some knowledge, of course, based on a lot of literature research, and they can do some empirical research as well, and they can link that. And uh, but most importantly, they can ask questions that should make you as, as a practitioner think. And I think that is the main thing that we need in, or, or in rethink. organizations. Or rethink. Or rethink. Yeah, yeah or, or view critically. So if if you encounter a student that wants to do an interview with you, and I'm speaking to the business people right now, uh, the first thing is uh, please say yes. It only costs you an hour of your time and it really adds value if you do something useful with it. And the second thing is um, don't focus too much on your answers because you know those. I trust that. But focus on the questions that are asked and ask yourself, why does this person ask me these questions? Because that is the interesting thing. There's something behind there. And of course, towards the end of the conversation, you can also ask that towards your student, like, okay, you've asked these questions and some of them made sense to me and some didn't, but please tell me a little bit more about the background and why these questions were relevant in the first place. Because that's what you're gonna take out of it. Mm -hmm. It's gonna make you reflect on your own work through the perspective of somebody who looks at it uh, in a conceptual way, and that's, you know. As an outsider, right? That's also, also as, an, as outsider, an outsider, but also from a very conceptual viewpoint. And, and in my experience, that helps you to spot fundamental structural problems in your in your way of doing business. Mm. It's, it's really looking at, at the, the, the conceptual perspective of uh, things. Right, no, I agree, I agree. That's interesting. I have not, uh, I've not looked at that before. Huh. Yeah, it's a, yeah. So we, we kind of took a turn here. No, that's all right. That's totally all right. It's still, um, it's still about, well, the experience of teaching entrepreneurship, right? It is still it's a bit still, about, yeah. It's still yeah. about that. But okay, now, now let me try to combine what we talked about before when it came to like the dragon's den or shark right. tank. Yeah, yeah. Something that I was very, I mean, okay, you know, I'm, I have academic training, now I'm doing entrepreneurship stuff. But one thing I was always doing was I wanted to do my homework, not to mm. do every not to do everything perfect, yeah. but at least to be prepared of a, to, to be able to deal with a situation mm -hmm. when it's in front of me. Or at least when I know a situation is in front of me and I don't know how to deal with it, mm -hmm. to at least know what can I do to still get the most out of this situation or do I need to take a step back? Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. What I thought was very strange with any entrepreneurship course that I participated in or was part of giving was the lack of any type of specific entrepreneurship books mentioned hmm. to the students to continue reading. Okay. Right. So what I mean yeah. by this is... So I have, uh, for example, you have the Lean Startup. Yeah, of I course. Think, I think it was Eric, yeah. Eric Ries. Yeah. 
um, great book. Mm -hmm. It's take something conceptual, immediately yeah. puts it into practice and yeah. helps you to do that exactly on your own case. Yeah. You have principles. Mm -hmm. um, oh, God. I, was it Ray Dalio? I, I'm not 100% oh, sure. No, no, no. Um, principles. You also have the effective executive. Yeah. You know, these books are treated in the, let me say, just realm of entrepreneurship mm -hmm. as like Bibles. Yeah. You yeah. need to read these. Yeah, exactly. But never, yeah. ever have I heard anyone in any of these when I was suggesting these mm -hmm. and I had students who were already were already far along their trajectory of mm -hmm. I don't know, becoming managers or participating in entrepreneurship courses they have never ever heard of any of these books and I personally just couldn't believe it because these books are are worth their weight in gold basically yeah. because you learn not only from an entrepreneurship perspective but also from the yeah, intrapreneurship or life tools mm -hmm. perspective mm -hmm. or you know other things where we did then this 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 role play of dragons den but what i have also never heard of teachers suggesting you know what watch shark tank don't just watch it analyze it take the good deals take the ones that actually got a deal Look at the ones that didn't get a deal. And now you have two camps. You have two sides of data. Analyze what happened. What happened? Was it the idea? Was it the communication? No. Mm -hmm. Was it the, the, um, the valuation idea the entrepreneur mm -hmm. had? Was it then the percentage they were willing or not willing to give up? Did they negotiate mm -hmm. what happened? You know, nothing. No, I no. have never, ever heard this advice given by any teacher ever. It's odd, isn't it? And yeah. I find this so <clears throat> strange. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm And I'm wondering, can, can, you, can you fathom some explanation of, of why do you think that is? Well, there's, there's, there's basically two things. Uh, so you mentioned books. Right. <clears throat> uh, many of the books that, that, uh, that we indeed know about that, that have become very popular. And on the other hand, you mention uh, basically case studies in the form of very accessible media mm -hmm. like Shark Tank. And uh, uh, what comes to mind also is The Apprentice. Oh, the, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. And that was gold yeah. as well. That and, was uh, gold really as well. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Um, so why is that not used as much as it could? Well, firstly, I, I don't know how many people actually use these books in their teaching. And I have the impression that, for example, The Lean Startup by Rees actually does uh, play a fairly significant role in teaching and also research. Okay. Uh, I have a couple of students doing research into, uh, into entrepreneurship at this moment. And one of the main things that they rely on is, uh, is the concept of the Lean Startup. Mm -hmm. Um, as a sort of counterbalance against the uh, classic uh, idea of uh, write your expensive, you know, uh, business plan, uh, your own business bible, and this is this is the way you're going to do it. You know, being more flexible. Uh, so the first thing is, I I'm not really sure if these books are really not used as much as they should. But uh, the second thing is, uh, you know, why would they not be used as much? And if I look at the academic perspective, then I notice that there is uh, very often a distrust against these kind of more practice oriented books. Mm -hmm. And I can sort of see the sense in that, because if you talk about conceptual clarity and conceptual and also empirical evidence, that this is not the strongest point of these books. That's true. They they always run a little bit the risk of falling into you know we 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 spoke of this dimension of falling into this category of um, uh, I've done it once so I know how it works. Mm -hmm. Very often these management books they're very inspiring but they're also written from the perspective of one particular person who has not necessarily done or tried to do a job of a critically. Um, um, falsifying all the things that they try to say. They have a fairly coherent story to tell and it's an inspiring story and it's a story that many people recognize parts of and they see the sense of it. So it has a lot of face validity, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not necessarily always a conceptually uh, bulletproof story. And I think for academics, that makes it a little bit difficult to sort of recommend this kind of stuff because they say, well, it's, it's one-sided. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily sufficiently validated. 
And then, of course, we run into a problem with academia because by the time things like the Lean Startup have become validated... It's been out for a while. <laughs> that is exactly. And uh, we're currently working with it, you know, right, yeah. trying to trying to figure out how it works from an academic perspective. Uh, so that means by the time that these, these books go out of fashion, uh, by that time, academia is, get, is catching up. Oh, wow. <laughs> so we're lagging behind. I think that is, that is most of the problem. Um, and we talked about these uh, universities of pl applied sciences. And there I see people are a little bit more uh, likely to recommend this kind of reading. Uh, then if I look at uh, the other example that you gave of the, of the cases in the form of uh, shows and competitions that you mentioned. Be because just, just to quickly interject, yeah, sure. my counter argument <clears throat> would be the lots of academic literature I read when it comes to management science mm -hmm. um, because of course before I wanted to teach a course I wanted to be proficient I, I can't stand I can't stand teachers who are obviously not prepared uh, <laughs> they should be standing there in the first place but I also read plenty of those and what I saw were also lots and lots of case studies yeah sure which yeah. which so my I'm more of a quantitative mm -hmm. um background like yeah. empirical yeah. get get your data analyze okay. it mm -hmm. stats mm -hmm. left and right so when i read the case study after case study and then i read it therefore mm -hmm. my alarm bells rang big time Why? Be because i don't know which case studies were deemed case study good enough for this thread of story yeah. and that is what i mean so that's why I was also like, wait a minute, this is, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying anything against qualitative research. Yeah. No, you shouldn't because that's really my. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I think no, no, no. it has its place have, and, yeah, and just as with qualitative, it, it has pros and cons. Obviously, obviously. Yeah. But this was a critique point my colleagues never really liked to hear, but they had no true counter argument to it either. No, and I think it's uh, I, uh, I think because there are no counter arguments. I mean, if you're critical of case study research, then obviously this is largely correct. And again, I'm also not saying that case study research doesn't work or that qualitative research doesn't work. I should know better. Um, but um, it's not bulletproof. Like, so if you have questions on, in this case, uh, case selection, right. Then of course you can look at the case selection criteria that people applied and how trans transparent are they about the, the identity of the cases, which is very often anonymized for, for very understandable reasons. Understandable, yeah. um, so you can look at the, basically their methods and see is, is, this, is, is this an approach that uh, conceivably would result in sort of dependable outcomes. Mm -hmm. But I think you also have to keep in mind that, that uh, case study research and qualitative research in general, I mean, the outcomes, you interpret them differently from quantitative research. I mean, right, with course. quantitative yeah. research, obviously we can say, uh, yes, this is true or no, it is, is, this is not true. There, there is a relation or there isn't. And we can say that with stati uh, statistic significance. And of course, in case study research and qualitative research, it's much more about uh, finding mechanisms, how things uh, could progress and how they actually progressed in a specific instance right. and then trying to understand why this is the case. Mm -hmm. And then from that, uh, try to generalize towards a more theoretical level and then try to uh, recognize, so uh, is there a more general principle at work here? Mm -hmm. And how could we test that general principle? And of course, the shortcoming of uh, much of the, the research, particularly in business science, is that we see the theory generation, but we don't see all that much of theory testing on all that theory that's generated. So a lot of case study research ends with, well, it could be this or that way. We should really test this rigorously one day and it doesn't happen. And of course, based on that uh, uh, finding, you could say it, it's kind of all, you, you have to look at it critically. Right, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think that's that's I think that should be the take home message that uh, if it's any of these books that you read, or if it's also the academic literature, you should always read this critically. There's, there's no, no yeah. this resource is better than that resource. Well, it, it depends it what it is, but exactly the, the amount of critique or let's say the the depth of critique is a different one. Exactly. Uh, and, yeah. But you should you should always 
always always be take it with a grain of salt you should take it with a grain of salt and i think you, i mean uh looking at it positively take it as a source of inspiration right and uh, particularly with quality qualitative research uh see it as a collection of uh ideas that that may or may not work mm -hmm. But that do make sense to some extent because they have been published in these peer-reviewed journals and this peer-reviewed process, as you, as you know very well, it, it's a very critical process. I mean, people really look very thoroughly at these at these results and they do question everything. Yeah. So the ideas themselves do make sense. What you don't know is if these ideas stand true in 100% of the cases. And I would say most likely not. But if, for example, you're running a business and you have a collection of uh, articles on entrepreneurship, uh, then probably the ideas in, in all those articles do make sense in one way or another for your business as well. Mm -hmm. But you'll have to transpose and translate them to your own uh, business. And that, of course, is something that um, maybe people don't expect that they have to put in that effort. I, I'm not really sure. Uh, maybe academics do a very poor job in, in effectively communicating the outcomes. But I do feel that there is a lot to be learned from, from just looking at that literature, although it's a very tedious job. That is true. And that, that is, is true. that is my main criticism against the academic literature. I mean, we have a very high emphasis in the academic world on publishing these, these kinds of things. Uh, but in my view, it's a super inefficient way of communicating the outcomes of academic research. Mm -hmm. And my personal opinion is also it is fundamentally a wrong way because we spend a lot of time on going through this peer review process with all the best intentions. It also means that there is a lag between the conception of a research and actually publishing the results of usually two to five years, if it's not even more, at least two years, before, you know, between identifying a research question and publishing results, if you manage that within two years, it's very fast. So that means where there's always a significant time lag. Uh, then it's gonna be published in some journal that at at least people in practice really don't read. I mean, it's only academics that scroll through them quickly to see which articles they need for their own reference list. So these articles aren't really getting read all that much uh, because you don't have the time to read all this stuff if you're setting up your own research. You'll have to sort of, you know... Uh, and you cannot just like casually read a paper. Not really. You have to filter very quickly based on titles and abstracts and conclusion sections. And sometimes you zoom in a little, a little further. Um, but it's, yeah. So they're not written for the, for the audience where the impact could be the biggest, which is the real world. Right. So there's a huge disconnect. And we've talked very briefly about valorization, you know, making uh, practical use of academically created uh, knowledge. Uh, the academic literature is like completely inappropriate <laughs> to do this. To do that. It's uh, the wrong tool. <laughs> Uh, and that is that is one of my main frustrations that we spend so much time in academia trying to push out these publications that are going to be referenced by other researchers for X number of times and that are in the most cases not being read at all mm. by practitioners. And all time we spend on that, we do not spend on interacting with the business world mm. where we could actually have an impact. Right. Well, that's crucial, but okay. Coming, segueing back to yeah, the to the sure. business world and the teaching part, which aspects now you? So you work with entrepreneurs, you work with business people. You've been an entrepreneur yourself. Yeah. Which skills do you think are crucial to have as an entrepreneur? So let's just say for a person that wants to start a business, are crucial, but do you th you think? are not being actually taught in these courses. That's a difficult one to just, you know, uh, to, to, to just do that off the top of my head. But uh, one thing that I, um, yeah, I've had, one of the projects that I've done, uh, that reminds me a couple of years ago was making an assessment of where uh, in one of the provinces in the Netherlands, where the, the manufacturing industry is going. And uh, this was, uh, something that the province wanted to know because they wanted to make good industry policy. Mm -hmm. Very noble. Uh, we went to talk, it was with two colleagues of Inotep. Uh, we went to talk with all these uh, entrepreneurs that we could find. It was a, a list of maybe, I don't know, 30, 40 uh, manufacturing firms that we selected from the province. And 
sat down with these people, large firms, but very many small, medium enterprises. And uh, one thing struck me was that if I sorted the, the successful ones from the ones that I thought, well, I'm not really sure if there is a future for you, mm -hmm. there was two characteristics. And again, this is not, you know, validated research, but something that just kind of struck me. Um, the first aspect that the successful entrepreneurs had was that they had a very active opinion and they talked a lot about how they saw the world and how they viewed the future. They really had a vision for how the world is changing and what their place is in that. Uh, very often they had some sense of idealism to go along with their business sense because they, they were also competent managers. Um, but they, they had a view of the world around them and not just, not just their customer base or their supplier network, but just the world in general. Uh, and they had these very, very inspired stories about that. And the second uh, thing that they had, the successful ones was, um, uh, how do you put it in English? I mean, uh, they had, um, they were not limited or bothered by uh, too much criticism, self-criticism, critical thought. Uh, they did not hinder themselves. Okay, that's that's super crucial. It's super crucial. You have to have some some degree of tunnel vision. I think that captures it quite well. Tunnel vision. They had a tunnel vision, and that tunnel vision consisted consisted of I have this vision of the future and the world around me. I have this vision of my role in that and my business's role in that, uh, which obviously is a successful business, and they were not bothered by seeing anything that could possibly go wrong. Maybe the major things like, okay, we need to do this development properly and okay, there's a competitor, but they were not bogged down by all kinds of reasoning like, hey, maybe my vision is not conceptually clear enough. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, I'm contradicting myself here, right? Because if you recall, I talked earlier about uh, conceptual clarity and looking right. at your business from a conceptual viewpoint. Uh, but, you know, you can do that too much or you can be bogged down by that. Oh, it, it, that it, is something that it can be to do. inaction. Actually, exactly. Because it, you just keep yourself busy with the theory and you think, ah, it's all going to be fine, but you actually never do anything. So, exactly. So then you yeah. also don't get anywhere. Or, yeah, or you can, you know, you can identify all the failure modes right, that are yeah. available. And, and obviously no, no plan is bulletproof. Of course not. Of course not. And that's what you kind of find out. And um, so, th so that's something that, that really struck me that these people are, are fundamentally optimistic. But then just to, maybe I would then reframe it. Maybe I would say the first point that you mean that the vision, the idealism and the talking about it is super strong communication aspect of not pushing your ideas on everybody, but trying to see, maybe trying to probe how these other people that you talk to see the world that, that you are envisioning. Or, uh, or maybe try to get more data in about your actual worldview mm -hmm. by trying to communicate it with your vision. And the second part, not bothered by criticism. I don't know. I Tunnel vision I often see as something like, this is where I go no matter what happens. Yeah. But it sounded more like a, a dedicated filter which... Is, yeah. which allows for, oh, somebody said something smart that I need to take into consideration from my worldview yeah, that, yeah, that I sure. should incorporate. Yeah. Oh, somebody else said something that completely makes no sense. Ignore. Yeah, yeah exactly. There's a, there's a, there's a, um, uh, in one of the workshops I was teaching uh, uh, quite recently, I collected a number of uh, very short sound bites or, or videos of, of successful entrepreneurs like, mm -hmm. like you know, Elon Musk and, and Steve Jobs. And actually, Elon Musk was not in there because <laughs> uh, just coincidence. But, um, um, you know, the people, the people who started LinkedIn and all these fairly well-known uh, businesses. And um, one of the sound bites was actually of a guy, I think it was the founder of LinkedIn, but I'm, I could be wrong. No, it was not a founder of LinkedIn. doesn't matter. He said, um, the important thing in succeeding as an entrepreneur is having a conviction ah, and making uh, no amount of data yeah, yeah. 
can sway that conviction. Oh, definitely not. Yeah, that's true. And that is the interesting balance because on the one hand, you need to be sensitive to criticism for people who actually have a point. So that filter that you have. And on the other hand, you have to have your conviction and hold on to it. Yeah. And that is the tunnel vision that I yeah. that I yeah. propagated. That's a tough balance to keep. And that is a tough balance. So I think that is so if there is one thing that that is not being taught in in entrepreneurship courses uh, and that really should be is how to balance this thing. Because this is the essential thing. We can we can teach everything about you know what to include in a business plan and what kind of things to think about when you do your your uh, launch strategy and you know all these things. It's, it's fairly straightforward it's a lot to take in but but it's i mean uh, uh, in a manner of speaking you you can almost uh, uh, get these things from from wikipedia and do it at your home but what you really need to train and practice at and and learn and conceptually grasp is how to filter the, the sense from the nonsense and how to 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 include the critical views that make sense into your business planning and to keep the, the nonsense at bay, right. even though the people who are talking the nonsense may be crucial stakeholders, yeah. mind you. Right, right. So maybe it's also that doing that and being nice while doing it. Yes. And maybe also learning the tools to be able to distinguish was this now nonsense or not. Exactly. Just like yeah. the f probing little probing that's often all it takes and after the first maybe, answer maybe you that's know. it maybe that's it maybe it's just a little probing i think it does take uh but it's often some... not taught i have i have i admit it's often not what students no. walk out of a university uh or, or some of these courses where they have not i mean it's, it's a crucial part of critical thinking i would say that doesn't only go as in i heard a story i'm criticizing it mm -hmm. end of story yeah. it's like no This is my story. I hear a criticism. I take that in. I flip it around and I ask a follow up question. Yeah. And this follow up thing in a life scenario, in a normal conversation, yeah. I have rarely seen happening. It's it's yeah, I, I would uh, I would agree. It's uh, it's rare. Yeah, it's rare. Particularly with a with a very productive outcome. <laughs> yeah, other than that, yes. I mean, you you don't have to go all the way down the rabbit hole. Probing, no, exactly. Right? That's, yeah. uh, you should know that after after um, asking the first question, like, oh, okay, this is a stakeholder. It is important. Criticism, ignore. This is maybe not even an important stakeholder. Criticism, valid. Let's see how deep we can go, so I can walk out of this conversation yeah. with the most amount of Uh, I don't like to use buzzwords, but actionable insight uh, yeah, yeah. to then make sure that my vision will stay on track, exactly. yeah. even yeah. though that criticism was valid exactly. or es especially because it was valid. Maybe even that. Yeah. No, that, I think that is a, that is a crucial thing. Yeah. Do the drill down yeah. Yeah. To, to a sufficient extent. If, if you encounter something that is worthwhile drilling down on, right? yeah. obviously. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's also your time. Right. exactly and you and need this, to be nice about it <laughs> and to be nice and uh, that as well so there's a lot of things that need to come together and i think that we all have the experience that once in a while you meet somebody with whom you can do that yeah. that actually has a message to tell and who's who's willing and able to actually uh, do the drill down with you uh and most of the people that you encounter it's either not the right moment or it's not they don't have the relevant knowledge or attitude or whatever right. and this is okay because That's you okay. Uh, th this is also this is another thing um uh, that i think should be taught and maybe it is taught but but not enough by me then in any case is uh how to balance between stability and and dynamics mm -hmm. uh so um my firm belief is that you increase your chance of, of starting a business or, or being an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur in whatever capacity is if you have a consistent and clear worldview and a very consistent and clear idea of how you're going to change the world, basically, even in a minor way. And um, the problem with having a clear and consistent worldview is that it takes some time to build it and you have to change it sometimes. Right. Because you learn things and it turns out you have been wrong all the time and you have to change some fundamental aspect of it. Uh, but the problem is if you build a business on that, then 
uh, you, you don't want to build it on quicksand. Right? Right, yeah, of course, you can't. So you have to strike the balance between having a worldview that is sufficiently stable and also a vision that, that translates into your business that's sufficiently stable to, to remain dependable, to make decisions upon, you know, strategic decisions. And on the other hand, allowing for the flexibility to change your world for you where you realize, no, I've been wrong at a fundamental level mm -hmm. and I need to change this. And I think that is also maybe it's uh, it's periods. So so I, you know, as an academic, I would think about things like uh, the punctuated equilibrium, um, uh, which is a concept that basically says you have periods of stability alternated by periods of change. And maybe it's something like that, so that it's that it's plotted out in time, that you have periods where your worldview is very stable and you can base decisions on them. And then you have to allow for periods of, of, of dynamics or of change where you can actually change that worldview as, so that it can become stable again in the future. Right. And I think managing that process and not letting it happen to you uh, I think that is that is also a crucial aspect of being an entrepreneur, and 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 now it's really a difference between being an entrepreneur as a person and the, the life cycle of the business. Because I can very well imagine that that um, as an entrepreneur, as a person, your worldview and your ambitions uh, ambitions change. Mm. Uh, but they the business, do, right? they always do. They always do. I, you grow older, and you know. Uh, we get more gray hairs, <laughs> right? I, I get less hair. <laughs> uh, and of course, your business also should change a bit. But I mean, you are not your business. So maybe it's very permissible that as your worldview changes, your relationship with your business also changes. Maybe you depart from it. Maybe you change the business altogether. Maybe you end it. Um, uh, keep in mind the, the, the introduction that I gave and, and, and the company that I had. I mean, that was a very good example. The world changed, my worldview changed, my ambitions changed. I knew this was happening. Um, it, so it was sort of intuitive. It could have ended very badly, but I was I locked out. Uh, and I said, okay, it's done. It's, it's a period that comes to an end. And I've literally had uh, people ask me later on, uh, I was doing uh, job interviews by then. I thought I was... I'm, I may wanted to work in consultancy. It was a stupid idea, but I was doing job interviews, and they said, "Why did you end the business? There were there were thousands of mid cap companies that uh, could have used your business." And I thought, "You do not understand the market I, I was in, mm -hmm. and you and you do not understand the way I was doing business and my worldview, because I could not have worked successfully with these mid cap." Uh, businesses the way I had worked successfully with the smaller businesses and the schools that I did before. Right. Uh, it was just a fundamental misunderstanding. I didn't take the job. Right. Ah. <laughs> and this ah. was a crucial. This was a crucial moment in a job interview for me. Okay. Because I thought we do not understand each other. Yeah. But this this is what I mean. This goes you having this insight. Yeah. Into it's not only that this person put out some criticism. It's you had the depth to reflect on that criticism going one step further as in what does that actually tell me about that person? I only generally. understood later. I only understood later at that moment. And I was like in my mid 20s or so. So it's, it's, it's some time ago. And I, I, it was only an intuition. I thought well, I'm, I don't feel I don't feel comfortable with these people. Mm -hmm. And I, it was not this question was not even actually I didn't sense it as, as criticism. It was just I thought, well, logical question. Uh, the guy tells you he had a business before. Now he's applying for a job here. Doesn't compute. Explain to me, uh, did you screw up the business? Ah. Right. OK, so where's your weak spot? And it was I, I interpreted that as that kind of question. And I explained like no it's a different uh, priority market has changed and i had no ambition to continue that etc etc cetera, etc cetera, et cetera. um but much later i realized that the that there was well quite likely a very fundamental misunderstanding of the way i did business and probably i didn't explain it clearly enough mm. right there's also a part of it but i think also knowing that person a little bit he probably was not capable of understanding Right, because yeah. <laughs> we were just different. Yeah. Uh, it's different yeah. characters, yeah. and uh, yeah, so there was just no match. Uh, but there was there was an interesting message from that as well, apart from no match. But at least, okay, I think what I, what I really like at what what came out in the last I think it was 15, 20 minutes of our conversation was 
what these entrepreneurship courses or entrepreneurship courses, classes, workshops, programs, whatever, are definitely missing. So if anyone's listening, that's giving I mean, these, this is yeah. I mean, this is your business try, model, right? Yeah, please try to to incorporate this. Everybody wins if you do this. I think so. Yeah, uh, you as a as a teacher, because these these skills that we just talked about, let it be communication or not being being so sensitive to criticism. These are skills not only necessary for entrepreneurship, right? This 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 is a important for life i would say i would say uh, so, it, would, yeah. it would make your life help. so much easier if exactly. you're not yeah. triggered by every little negative comment you hear from a person who who might meant well there's also something i'd like to say give always give benefit of the doubt yeah not everybody's Obviously. out there yeah. to to put you down uh, but sometimes it can just be miscommunication. Actually, that is the interesting thing. If, if but maybe I've been lucky. But if, in my experience, um, there's very, very few people who are actually out to get you down. Yeah, I have also not met any. Well, I have met a few, but there, I there have, are a few. There are a few. Absolutely, but they were uh, a minority. Well, and actually, super small minority. If they show that behavior, very, very often it's not even intentional. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, they, they do nasty things. You think, well, was that necessary? And again, the job interview that I just referred to, it, it, it turned nasty at some point and it was functionally nasty, right? Yes, yes, yes. It was yes. basically systematically trying to trigger me to get angry. And at some point, the guy said, well, I, I, no matter what I say, you don't get angry. Mm -hmm. I said, no, I don't because it's not worth it. Yeah. And um, so it was very functional applied. Uh, being a jerk, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, yeah. and that's what people do sometimes. And you know, uh, you give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe, yeah. maybe it's something they do intentionally because it needs to be done. Yeah, maybe they. It is the only way to get the message across with you because mm. you tend to have a fairly thick skull. I mean, right. that's very yeah. possible. It's as well. possible. It's possible. Uh, you know, I do have a mirror, so yeah, yeah it's possible. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe it's uh, 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 maybe it's something. That, they cannot help it. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe it's as simple as they slept bad or they're hungry. It's, it can be as simple I as mean, that. It's those things. And it's, yeah. So I, I mean, think, I know people that are, you, you, you cannot have a fun conversation with them when they are hungry. You can tell, I used to be that as well. And l luckily not anymore, but because I worked on that. Uh, but it's, it can be these simple things that have nothing to do with you. Exactly. So yeah. then just no, uh, it's, I mean, I've give it a benefit of somebody the doubt. in my family. It's probably going to be sound sound horribly sexist or wrong. It's not. It's not meant that way. But I've, I've lived in the same house with somebody, not one of my ex girlfriends, just to say that. Uh, and it was fairly dangerous to strike up a discussion when she was on her period. All right, <laughs> right. right. And uh, it's not. Again, it's not a sexist thing, but it was just. Uh, external influences you know well in this case very internal but just has nothing to do with uncontrollable the, uncontrollable beyond your control yeah. and i mean it just dictates how somebody uh, to what extent they, they they are sensitive to communicating in in, in a certain way yeah. and it's sometimes it's as stupid as that and if you assume like oh uh, she's doing that uh, uh, because of malevolent behavior or some kind of yeah obviously your relationship is going to suffer from it uh but if you think well it's you know this is not the day to discuss this topic yeah it's all good you know yeah, it's all it, good. It, it, we can do this next week you know it's fine and you know it's the same with everybody. If you if you talk to a potential investor and you, and you notice that they're not very enthusiastic about your plans, well, well maybe it's a good idea to not pursue the topic too much. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, exactly. See if there's a way to reschedule the meeting. Uh, sort of find a nice way of getting out of it, and and try again later. Right. It may just be a you know bad day. I have just two more questions for you. Yeah, well, sure. If you if you're still, no, it's, still fine, up for it's it. fine. It's fine. We should finish the job. <laughs> all right. All right. So, okay, this might sound a little cryptic and can go in any direction, oh, but um, do you think the current way entrepreneurship is being taught actually indoctrinates potential future entrepreneurs in a standard way of thinking? Um, I can only speak for myself because uh, this this would be really too dangerous to to uh, answer uh, in a more universal way. Right. So I can only go by what I've seen, what I've been actively involved in myself. Uh, and I would say no. 
Okay. Oh, that's no. good. I mean, that's, oh, that's yeah. a good answer. No, 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 no. Actually, it's, um, uh, and, and obviously, yes, it is bound to happen in places, uh, but I'm not very, you know, I know some places where it's probably the case mm -hmm. and where I have some doubts about the flexibility uh, in what is being taught. Mm -hmm. And by flexibility, I mean, it's going to be uh, useful and depend um, regardless of the context that you end up in as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. uh, but looking at myself, this is something I really try to prevent and, and I hope I kind of succeed. So if I talk about, for example, business plans, I always say, look, having a business plan is very useful. Mm -hmm. don't, don't get me wrong, but there's three things that you should understand about a business plan. The first thing is it should not be about fairy tales. So it should have a sense of realism. Uh, secondly, it should not be a stack of papers that you cannot climb on top of because nobody's going to read it. So it shouldn't be too long. And thirdly, and this is the most important thing, never ever carve it in stone. Right. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. a business plan is an organic thing is going to change. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that sort of expresses it. So it, is it is it That's dogmatic? Good. Uh, by definition, it cannot be dogmatic. I think you cannot, uh, and this sounds dogmatic, obviously, but you <laughs> cannot teach people the right way towards entrepreneurship. Yeah, yeah. And again, I'm going to, it's a bit repetitive, but I'm going to rely on what I said earlier. Um, if you want to uh, teach people something about entrepreneurship, you'll have to teach them about looking around them. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, trying to uh, help them to make sense of their environment, structure that information and translate that into opportunities that they can grasp, um, translate it into actionable strategies. I mean, uh, here's the buzzword again. Right. Um, I mean, that is what you can teach people to do, but you cannot teach them uh, or you should, I think, not teach them. Uh, okay, the, your strategy look, should look this way, mm -hmm. or this is the way to do a market launch. Mm -hmm. um, no, you'll have to figure that out yourself. Moreover, we're, we're living in a world of change, and yeah, yeah, particularly exactly. technological innovation. I could tell you how to do your market launch today, and, and next year is going to be different because we have all these different platforms to choose from, and you want to be able to, to use them in the future as well. Right. And the funny thing is that the structure of the world and how you study the world that has not changed much no. in the past century or so. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So humans are still humans. Humans are still humans. We still do the same thing. And it's still a complex world. And making sense of that complexity is, is not very much different to the time that Galilei tried to do that. Oh, yeah. yeah. But we have different technology that, that is at our disposal. So I would say no, there doesn't, there's, there's not necessarily very much, uh, um, um, there's not too much dogma, which is, good. That's good. which is good, but beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, referring to the, the popular management books, uh, I mean, if you read uh, Reese's uh, uh, Lean Startup, don't take it as gospel. Mm -hmm. It's okay if you view it as a Bible, mm -hmm. but that's not the same as gospel. That's a fair point. It's not, it's not a manual of this is how you should run your business. No, it's, an, it's a source of inspiration. Hey, crap, if we, if we have much quicker feedback cycles, if we confront our uh, ideas with a market much earlier, hey, that, that is a very powerful mechanism. Should you always keep doing that or should you do that in, in, in every possible situation? Hell no. I think there's definitely situations where it's, it's much better to do a linear development and do it very, uh, do not confront customers with it. Keep it to yourself. Uh, make sure it's right before you launch it. There's, uh, there's doubtlessly, there's, there's uh, situations where you should do that mm -hmm. and do not do the lean startup. Right. Um, so I think it also has to do with understanding what is the context where the information comes from. Mm -hmm. Whether it is a management book from Reese, whether it is uh, somebody who tells you who, uh, how to do entrepreneurship, try to understand their worldview. Right. Why are they saying it like that? Um, if, if you're talking to Elon Musk and he tells you how to do entrepreneurship, keep in mind that he comes from a fairly wealthy family. I mean, just that's just a very basic basic fact and that his his brother i think is a sister as well that they're all very entrepreneurial there's something in that family that stimulates them so if he's going to tell you how to do entrepreneurship you'll have to keep that in mind because that's his frame of reference and it's the same for 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 reading reese or whatever 
Right. Oh wow, that's. I mean, I'm, I'm glad to hear that that there is no, at least uh, a, across the board indoctrination uh, happening. So that's always good. And and just to combine it with what you said, your your business plan shouldn't be set in stone. Just in combination with the lean startup, I, I just heard. I also don't remember where I heard this. But it was a no business plan survives first customer interaction. Yeah, well, there you that's, go. That's, 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 that, that, that's a very good quote. That's a yeah. very good. I, I unfortunately forgot who said that, but this. But if you know is that, so true. if it's you so know true. that, you know not to invest too much in writing that first version because it's going to go the hell anyway. Exactly. And uh, the funny thing is that I have, for this year's uh, round of thesis, I actually made one of the topics for my bachelor students, which was a uh, uh, business plan, yay or nay. Yeah. Like, should you write one? And I think one of the students actually contacted you to interview you, so that right. that's why the questions came from. And um, and I really gave him. So I gave him on the one hand Reese, and on the one uh, on the other hand the classic uh, entrepreneurship literature, which says uh, like, okay, make the business plan, and these are the elements. And basically said, okay, so w now what? You know, one side says you should not have a business plan and try to make it up as you go along in a sort of structured way. And the other side says, no, no, plan ahead and make a business plan and then go get financing. And uh, so which is which, you know, yeah. you tell me and, yeah. and they go out in the world and investigate that uh, between you and me and, you know, the rest of the world now. <laughs> you know, I, th I think probably the, the more flexible dynamic way is, uh, is, is bound to be more successful. Mm -hmm. But I can see the sense of having a business plan as an artifact that you can communicate right. uh, towards stakeholders. And sometimes you need, I mean, if you go to the bank for financing, then obviously you will need some kind of business plan. Oh, for sure. They won't just give you any money. No, unfortunately. I mean, they should be listening uh, to the story and looking at the people in front of them. Uh, yeah. In that sense, you know, the world has become uh, an not necessarily a better place no. but maybe this is then a, also a good recommendation for the people sitting on the other side of the yeah. table the ones that have the finances and let's just say financial institutions because i think at least i hope investors they are they they do inspect not only the business plan but the person they do and, look at the people but often yeah. the the financial institutions which are also crucial instruments in entrepreneurship often don't do that yeah. because yeah. May maybe it is uh, also not trying to place blame on anyone. I could just imagine that is in the nature of their business in the first place. And that is yeah. why that might be happening. I think, yeah. yeah, I think it's very, very difficult from the, from the perspective of the financer because you have to balance risk between uh, risk and opportunity. And uh, I think there's something, you know, looking at, for example, the role of banks, mm -hmm. you know, um, 60 years ago, if you were starting an enterprise, you would go to the bank for credit. And based on your story uh, and your credibility as a person, you would either get it or not. Yeah. you know simplified i mean it was not if you if you came to ask for 20 million but if you came to ask for 20k uh, that was probably what happened you you went to the branch manager and and sat down and talked and um the thing is that i think we've as a society we've become risk averse this is something that has definitely happened to banks uh, apparently, it has not helped enough. Look at the credit crunch of 10 years ago. So it, it, it was not even effective. No. Uh, and I think it was all for in the wrong way. Uh, I mean, if you look at an entrepreneur and try to estimate what is the risk of investing in this entrepreneur, you want to know if the story makes sense. Sure. And if the person is capable of making the story work. And it's not about, you know, how many, how many pages, pages does the business plan have and uh, is the financial statement, does it, does it look well prepared in relation, to, uh, in relation to the accountancy standards that we have? I don't, I don't give a damn. I, I want to understand, is the fundamental mechanism of the business that he proposes, does that make sense within the context of the world that he sees? Mm -hmm. And do I understand that world vision? And does it does it align with what I know about it in terms of facts, facts and figures? And if that is the case, then it's probably worthwhile investing in it. Um, so I think it's, uh, you know, take out the bureaucracy of that. Uh, that is one of the things that, that still is holding back, uh, I think, uh, the, the flourishing of entrepreneurship, in, uh, particularly in Europe. Mm -hmm. 
We have to take risks and that, that is true for the entrepreneurs, but there's sufficient number of people who are willing to take some risks. Uh, and I think particularly at the low end of entrepreneurship, and I call it low end because of, these are the people who, who start new web shops and I don't know what, uh, you, you could, probably could help if, if capital was a little bit more mobile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so too. Well, Raphael, on that note, I think it's, uh, yeah, I think we're, we've come to an end of our conversation. On that bombshell. <laughs> on that bombshell. No, I think it's good because that's, that's, I think, the high note that people can take home with and then work on if I, hopefully they, hopefully they will. Uh, but at least now they know of how to think about a world around them a bit better. That's it. And that's, that's, I think that's it. Yeah. That's and it. if you yeah. can incorporate that into any type of courses or interactions between institutions, it's all for the better. Absolutely. I think we should all try to tra uh, change the world to some extent and in, yeah. uh, in some capacity. And I try to do it by changing and, and talking to people and actually uh, talking to you right now. Yeah. Uh, my students are doing it by helping companies to figure out certain problems. And I think ent entrepreneurs can do it by uh, bringing the products and services that they think are useful uh, because they're usually right. That is the one thing that I've learned in uh, working with entrepreneurs is that I can tell them all kinds of things about how I think sh it should be done, uh, but they know best. Right. And I can only ask questions. Yeah. Or so, at least they're willing to find out. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Because yeah. it's in their interest. Yeah. So instead of telling them how it should be done, I think I'm going to change my teaching into only asking questions. All right. <laughs> so thanks for that. No, <laughs> hey, it's, uh, no, no problem. My, my pleasure. Um, so uh, for, to the listeners, if they want to find you online somewhere, where can they find you? If yeah, they, they want to reach out to you? They can always find me on LinkedIn. And uh, I have to admit that I don't do much in the, in the way of updating LinkedIn on websites because uh, I, I vastly prefer uh, direct contact, personal contact. So mm -hmm. if you want to reach out, uh, definitely feel welcome. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, LinkedIn uh, slash in slash R-S-M-A-L-S, which is my initial letter and my last name, R Smalls. Uh, or you can uh, go to www.rsmalls.nl. So basically, again, my initial letter plus my last right. name. And there, of course, I was on there already as well. And there people can find more about InnoTap, something you mentioned earlier. Yes. It's just the yeah. innovation in theory and practice. It's like a small yeah. conference where it's business, conference. business yeah. government and uh, academia meet that is correct we do that every year and it's going to be the 10th or 11th time this year again so uh we've done every time last friday of september it's in dutch it's in nijmegen so if you want to attend it's free to attend this year is going to be about robotics robots cobots and artificial intelligence is going to be very nice there's going to be companies uh, uh, on the stage talking about what they're going to do uh, in terms of uh, automation it is still focused on the manufacturing industry but we will also ask questions about meaningful work and uh, how does all this automation uh, factory automation influence uh, us as humans uh, working in these companies and uh, that's it's, uh, it's super, interesting. super interesting and there is usually still a place for some people to attend so definitely uh, uh, definitely go to my website and uh, click some links so also to everyone's listening I'm, I'm going to put all of this of course also in the show notes you can find that on the website that uh, you don't have to you can google of course but you don't have to including of course all these books and and other things we talked about Ravel, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, to everyone's listening, you have a great day. Thank you very much. Hey, everyone. Just one more thing before you go. I hope you enjoyed the show. And to stay up to date with future episodes and additional content we share, you can sign up to our blog and you'd get an email every Friday. Why Friday? Because it's almost weekend and we want to give a fun end of the week bonus that you can also talk about during your Friday afternoon drinks. It'll be a short email with our latest updates about bridging the gap between science and UX. The content we share ranges from conversations between UX and science, like we have on this podcast, our own journey from scientists turning into entrepreneurs, all the way to our own studies where we dig deeper into concepts of UX. 
If you want to receive that to stay in the loop, sign up at mind-trace.com slash blog. M-I-N-D-T-R-A-C-E dot com slash blog. 